Good morning, everybody in Sharm El Sheikh here at COP27, and good afternoon, good evening, everybody who's watching us on live. We're having a discussion this morning around the blue economy and particularly the leadership of small island developing states in the blue economy. But context is the starting point for any conversation, so I want to put a few numbers on the table. Today, while we're sitting here in Sharm, there's 222 million people who are on the brink of famine. We're living in a world where 719 million people have to live on less than $2.15 a day. Think about that. That's catastrophic destitution. There's 759 people just in Africa who don't have access to electricity. And that's 30 million more people today than before COVID. Think about that, 30 million people who had access to electricity, who had the lights come on, who are now living in the dark. There is 89 million people who are forcibly displaced, living as refugees more than at any time, including since World War II. And 70% of 10-year-olds don't know how to read or write. Now, you may wonder when we're having a conversation around blue economy why any of that matters. It's because if the ocean was an economy, it would be in the G7. It would be the seventh largest economy in the world. It provides jobs for hundreds of millions of people. There's only 719 million people living on less than $2.15 a day because the oceans provide jobs, provides income, there's only 222 million people going hungry, hungry tonight because people have access to fish and other types of food sources from the ocean. So the ocean economy, the blue economy, is critical for jobs, for GDP, for food security, for energy. The conversations around wind energy and wave energy are the fast, some of the fastest growing conversations in the renewable energy space. So the oceans are not just a critically important carbon sink, they're a critically important platform for our transition from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. And nowhere is this more important than in the small island developing states. And I'm delighted this morning to be joined by two powerhouses when it comes to setting policy and implementing action in the blue economy space. With me here in person, is Khadija Nassim, who is the State Minister for Climate Change in the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Technology in the Maldives. Khadija, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you for having me. And a huge thank you in particular to Chamberlain Emmanuel, who is the Director for Environmental Sustainability in the OECS, which is the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, in the OECS Commission. And Chamberlain, in particular, I want to thank you for joining us because it is the middle of the night where you are. And I have to say, you look incredibly fresh and awake. So a huge thank you. And if I can, I'd like to start with you, Chamberlain, because, of course, the Caribbeans are not small island developing states. They're great ocean states, just like Maldives. What does the blue economy mean to you, to your economy, and to your discussions around climate change? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. And um, greetings also to my colleague on the panel. Yes, well, as, as you've indicated, the, not just on a global scale, but on our local scale, the blue economy is, is critical. And for us, it actually, we think it represents uh, probably our last hope for true sustainable socioeconomic prosperity. And, and, and so um, for, for us, a, a blue economy is, is, is really critical. We, as small islands, we, we champion the approach that we refer to as um, island systems management, because based on our scale and the nature of our ecosystems and sectors, it is all integrated, interconnected, cross-cutting and multidimensional. And so everyone, is really involved in the blue economy. The blue economy for us is not simply about the, the physical ocean, but because of an island, whatever happens in the terrestrial space also impacts the, the, the integrity of our ocean and issues such as, 
such as pollution, which with, with land-based sources, for example. So this blue economy really envelops our entire way of life as an island. And so we have really proposed um, various strategies and, and approaches to help us position ourselves. And so we have uh, blue economy strategies, we have national ocean policies, we have um, coastal and marine spatial plans to ensure we introduce clarity and, and, and guidance as we seek to position ourselves as, as what we have captured, a model blue economy region, trying to work with, with private sector, public sector, and civil society to achieve this goal. Khadija, let me ask you, I mean, Chamberlain talks about the blue economy as, as being a ridge to reef, whole of economy, whole of government, whole of space, whole of geography. Is that true in the Maldives too? I, I believe so, because, you know, we, the Maldives is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. We are a large ocean state. We're only a meter above sea level. We have the seventh largest reef system in the world and we are experiencing the effects of climate change, and we depend on, on these reefs for our life. We are from the ocean. So our tourism, our fisheries, our livelihoods, all of it is connected, and also our very existence is connected with the oceans. And we all know from the IPCC uh, working group to report uh, that if, if the world continues to heat, up at the rate that it is going, it, you know, we only have 86 months left until 2030. And this is when the 1.5 degrees is expected to shoot. And in this scenario, the likelihood with high confidence, according to the IPCC, the likelihood of the corals dying are 70 to 90%. This is really high and this will have an impact on the Maldives. And while we cannot control the mitigation efforts of the world, we are urging for it and we are calling for it. We have to, meanwhile, ensure that we do everything uh, with our sustainable development in a way that strengthens our resilience. And so our blue economy strategy would be meeting the immediate needs in terms of environmental conservation and, and in strengthening resilience in these sectors while also mitigating uh, for the future climate impacts that we are going to have. So we are doing lots of things with various partners to understand our ecosystem better and to see how we could plan our development in a way that we preserve the, we conserve the, the, the nat nature of Maldives. We also get the economic benefits, but we also overall strengthen the resilience of our community. It's that connection between environment and economy that is so critical, but Khadija, I know you're negotiating at COP, and this is existential for you, and it's for many of the islands, including in the Pacific Islands, for example, where the difference between an increase in temperature of 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees could be the difference between life and death, between existing as nations and disappearing into the history books. Are you being heard at the negotiating table? I, I do believe that currently there is a very big political momentum in the negotiation space where all of the countries, whether you're developed or developing, we know that we have to address the very, very difficult question of losses and damages. And we have been trying to ad address, uh, we, we have been trying to mitigate, we have been trying to do adaptation. Unfortunately, we are in a space where we have to consider even losses and damages. And before I go into the negotiation space, I would like to highlight the importance of adaptation uh, for the Maldives in the negotiation space, because this is critical for us to plan and do sustainable development in a way that we are able to address the underlying risks of the systems that are critical for all of us in the world. So whether you are in Norway, whether you're in the Maldives, you're going to have the underlying risks in the area of water, biodiversity, health, food, infrastructure. And so we need to be able to have the adaptive capacities and the access to technology and capacities and, uh, and the knowledge 
and the funds, the critical funds to plan our development in a way that we are ab able to absorb the shocks better and minimize having to deal with loss and damages. Because without this, our countries who are currently, at least for the Maldives, we are a middle income country right now, but if we are having to spend more from our own budget uh, on addressing the impacts of climate change, we could slide back so, like, social protection wise. So what we could have been spending on education, health, um, you know, education and health could now have to be going into addressing disasters. And we don't want to slide back. We want to enjoy to have a good uh, prosperous economy and we want to live well into the future despite the climate crisis and plan for the emergency that's coming. And Chamberlain, unfortunately, this is something that the Caribbean nations know all too well. On average, Caribbean nations are losing 3.6% of GDP every year from storms. But the truth is, that's only if you average it out. In 2017, we saw from Hurricane Maria, over 200% of Dominica's GDP was wiped out just in those 48 hours. So. Just as Khadija was talking about this systems approach, how does the Caribbean approach that integral systems management you were talking about when it comes to building resilience and making sure your infrastructure, your economic infrastructure, but also your physical and human capital is adapting to the realities of more hurricanes, more climate change? Yes, well, I think we, we certainly share um, this with the Maldives and and, and I think, you know, we really need to reiterate here that we, we are going through what we refer to as a cyclical retardation. You, you get hit and you, you have to uh, endure uh, significant debt to deal with that shock. And then you get hit again and more debt and the cycle keeps going. And this is really not, not sustainable. Um, for us, the, the, similarly, the issue of adaptation is critical because while we continue to, to champion for ensuring that we remain within the 1.5 threshold, and the, the, the evidence, the evidence is, is, is there that we are speeding towards the 1.5 threshold. And so adaptation is critical because, again, the science shows that even if we were to remain within 1.5, the effects of 1.5 are still devastating to small island states. And so we, in, in, our, in our design and implementation of critical infrastructure, if we speak about the blue economy, infrastructure is critical in the you know, coastal um, infrastructure for ports, for, for, um, for roads and, and other um, business ventures, we now have to do these at a different scale because of the impact of climate change. And so this incremental additional financing required uh, needs to be at the table so that we can, we can truly uh, adapt and, and position ourselves for, for prosperity. And Chamberlain, earlier you talked about marine spatial planning. Is that an important part of having a strategy for adapting that infrastructure and thinking about how to do it and even figuring out the costs. How important is marine spatial planning and what kind of a role is the OECS Commission playing in helping your member countries have access to that information and good practices to make that work? Yes, certainly. Marine spatial planning simply is all about uh, making the right decision. So we, 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 we need the, the, our resources are limited. Uh, our space is limited with respect to, to land and, and even with the vast ocean space, we need to prioritize. And, and this prioritization takes into account climate change considerations, uh, knowing what, what is existing with respect to climate change and what is coming, this prioritization must be based on risk assessment. And so our coastal and marine spatial plans that we, that we have, have developed together with our member states have taken into account um, those climate-related risks so that we, we can determine you know, where do we position which economic activities 
because of that climate risk. We've had to 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 um to to shift um certain considerations uh because it is no longer normal. And and we, we have communities, for example, which which have been dependent on, on fishing and on other livelihoods connected with the ocean space and at serious risk being being bombarded by 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 the by the ocean, um, being inundated with with flooding, and so the very the very livelihoods, the very survival, the culture, the culture of our of our communities are significantly effect, affected by this risk, and we have sought to take this into consideration in prioritizing in prioritizing the way we plan for the use of our resources. Now this this cyclical dance, this terrible dance you talk about where countries stand up, small islands are investing in adaptation and resilience, never enough money to do it and only being knocked back regularly and having to start not only from zero but often from less than zero and having to start again. And Khadija, I wanted to ask you, it's all about risk management, understanding that there's always going to be risks and the risks are getting worse, but you come from the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Technology. What's the role of technology in the blue economy and in this risk management space? So the role of technology is very, very big. So first of all, uh, for, for countries like ours with, with uh, with capacity constraints and also the geographical limitations in the sense the Maldives is a very large ocean space. We are 1,200 islands and we are scattered. It, it is a very large area to study and understand. So we need to, first of all, understand our ecosystems and what's out there very, very well before we are able to, while we d formulate our policies. So, so, f so getting, harmonizing the data we have already, finding the gaps and then s and researching for the information we need to make the right decisions, technology is very important. And it also can increase transparency of what's available. Um, and it could also it could also be used for data sharing, which is so critical across the island uh, island nations and, and and with researchers. So one of the things that we're all, always saying is yes, there's a there's a best available science out there. The IPCC has come up with a 1.5 report. There's an adaptation report, but does it actually specifically help a country like the Maldives if we are having to guess? Um, those data into our our political economy, but also our natural natural systems. So I think in order for us to ensure that we are the actions that especially that the adaptation measures we are taking are actually not maladaptation, um, and and in making our situation further worse, we have to really understand. Um, what's out there and 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 do the and, and take the right decisions and for this the 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 role that knowledge researchers play the role of technology in in uh, doing these surveys in this very vast area and the role of technology in in uh, basically arranging the data sharing the data making it available it is critical Clearly this idea about there being so much focus on global numbers and global data, but how do you have the data for decision making at the national level? And Chamberlain, I wanted to ask you, one of the, the, the reasons the OECS Commission exists is exactly to help its member countries think about and get access to that data for decision making and make sure that not only do they have access, but they know how to use it, they have the capacity, and they can do peer learning, and there can be some regional convergence in terms of how that data is used. Do you have some good examples of how that has worked, or some bad examples of where global data is not being translated into the level that Khadija was talking about, where you can actually make decisions? Yes, certainly. Well, to, be, to begin with, as I indicated, the, the, the approach that we, we drive in is the island systems management approach. And, and because of the fact that, you know, sectors and issues are so, you know, interrelated and, and 
and cross-cutting, data sharing is very important, even at the national level, to ensure that the decisions that we make in one sector you know, um, helps other sectors. And so uh, we, we are promoting what we call National Ocean Governance Committees, where um, you know, we bring together various players at the national level to plan and prioritize together to share information, to share priorities, to ensure that those decisions, again, um, consider that what happens in one space affects the other, what happens in one sector affects the other, and it must be done in a holistic way uh, to, to work well. Also, at the regional level, we have what we refer to as the ocean governance team, and that is bringing now representatives from each national space into the regional space where we can we can exchange we can plan and we, we can we can prioritize as the region recognizing that there are critical cross-boundary issues that we can only deal with together and 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 i also need to mention you know the, the whole issue um you know of of access benefit sharing because the, the fact is we do have capacity limitations when it comes to understanding our ocean space. We do not have you know, all the tools and, and capacity to deploy into our vast ocean space to truly understand the, the potential, but we have other players coming in to supposedly do, do, do research, but then it, it ends up that some of this research is being, is being capitalized uh, for, for business opportunities and, and the benefits do not come back to our local people. So there is data out there that needs to come back to us and work in partnership with us so that we can benefit from our resources. This idea of information asymmetry and data asymmetry is such an important one. And I think it's true for many countries and many topics, but Khadija, do you have something equivalent to what Chamberlain was talking about in the Eastern Pacific, uh, excuse me, the Eastern Caribbean, the National Ocean Governance Committees? Does the Maldives have something similar where you're, where you're able to share ocean data and blue economy data across sectors and ministries? So, it's, so just as I mentioned earlier, the Maldives is actually um, working on our blue economy strategy and this is being uh, led by the government of Maldives in partnership with several partners. So we have the UNDP, World Bank, JICA, ADB and, and the Blue Prosperity Coalition and we're working on the blue economy and developing the marine spatial plan to protect at least 20% of our EZ. And we have found that Maldivians show great awareness appreciation of the pristine nature and several of the stakeholder interviews conducted by the teams emphasize on how they don't have a tourist economy but a coral reef economy. So this is one of the important findings and, and we have been, the government has been working on across the Maldives it's a, in a very inclusive procedure. And the coral reefs are of course the main attraction for tourists. It pro also provides the local fishermen with fish and tuna bait and it's also our first natural barrier of protection from erosion. So the efforts to maintain the natural environment have increased steadily since the realization of the economic benefits they can draw from having a pristine environment. The word pristine is so important and we have come up with uh, some of the potential of uh, future key developments that the Maldives can explore and exploit for its natural capital strategy. And this involves, just to give some examples, so in the future natural resources, biodiversity and endangered species will become a highly valuable currency, a tradable currency across multiple industries such as medicine, energy, pharmaceutics, etc. And being rare and increasingly extinct, People will love to travel to see, feel, and experience real nature and pay a premium prices to eat real and natural food from its natural resources. So this is both an attraction and a potential export. The, we also think the skill and expertise to preserve and grow natural resources 
biodiversity and rare species will become highly valued in the communities. So countries from across the world will want to grow, restore, and protect their nature for climate resilience and human health. So we could come up with things like carbon and ecosystem service trading, marine protected areas and management, which we already do, vertical farming, floating solar, wellness tourism, and premium branding value in addition to fisheries. So this is our vision, and there's work that's been ongoing with all these partners to reach there. It sounds like an incredibly exciting blue economy strategy when it's built on the idea that blue capital is economic capital, and it's because it's becoming more scarce, it's also becoming more highly valued and is going to become a comparative advantage of not just small islands, great ocean states, but of many developing countries and coastal communities. But we can't end this conversation without talking about finance. Because at the end of the day, you need money to be able to invest in natural capital, whether it's to protect it or to make sure that it is part and parcel of your economy. Chamberlain, when we talk about finance and climate finance, we always talk about three things. Quantity, there's never enough. Quality, is it doing what it's committed and promised to do? Is it having results? And access. And I know the issues around access to climate finance are particularly challenging for small islands. Can you speak a, bit, a little bit about how that is affecting the ability of Caribbean nations and, and Eastern Caribbean small islands in particular to get the money they need to build the resilience against climate change? Yes, ab absolutely. And, and uh, the first point you raise of quantity, we know quantity is not an issue. The issue is not quantity. The, the issue is the distribution. The issue is, is access. And, and, and so even when there, there are many buzzwords and, and, and approaches and tools that are spoken about in terms of financing the blue economy, blue bonds, etc. But the issue of scale, scale is critical for small islands. We need these tools and, and those who, who bring the financing to design instruments that fit our scale. And, and oftentimes, you know, we, we have a lot of nice words and speeches, but when you get to the table, when you approach investors and, and developing partners, then you are told that, oh, because of your size, it is not bankable, it is not sustainable. We need the international community to come to the table with tools for our scale. And it is not enough to just, to just speak about what can work. We need tools that actually work. And, and I mentioned con, con, um, earlier considering the issue of capacity. It, we, 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 we know we have capacity issues in small islands. And so the, the means of accessing the finance needs to take this into consideration. It, it, we cannot pretend that small islands are not different. We are different. And so we need the, the, the pathway to access. We need the tools to be customized for our circumstance, else it will just be uh, another a round of, of, of talk and speeches, but at the end of the day, we are left without the critical finance we need um, to both adapt as well as to position ourselves for prosperity in the blue space. No, I think introducing that idea around justice and financing, that the money needs to go where it's most needed, and as Khadija, you had said earlier, Small islands are the most vulnerable. The Maldives is one meter above sea level. You need the financing. This isn't a nice to have, it's a must have. And as Chamberlain said, it's money that has to be brought at the right time, enough to make a difference and at the right price. What does the Maldives need tomorrow that's different from today in terms of making particularly international public finance work for you? Thank you so much. And I agree with everything that Chamberlain has just mentioned. We are, we are even in the COP in the negotiation space discussing this very, very highly politicized um, um, issue of finance. We know that the public finances are not enough. 
we know what's even happened to the 100 billion that's been promised uh, a, a decade ago. It's not materialized. And we know from the IPCC report that the window of opportunity to adapting to climate finance is closing. And this is why we are also going into the loss and damage territory. Um, and here we are discussing all of this. So I do believe that public grant-based funding should be made available to the, to, for adaptation for small island countries, which is really, really critical. And since Glasgow, there has been uh, a, a promise to double adaptation financing, which will now reach 40 billion, which is a great step. But we know this is not enough. We also know that the real money is out there in the world, because he mentioned scale. And, and what we, we are in unprecedented times that require unprecedented uh, financial flows to address climate impacts. And so we have to think of creatively of the outside space and of the international financial architecture. And, and this would include things such as the reform of the MDBs and the IFIs to help countries address the fiscal constraints that they're facing in their country. Um, this, would also, uh, this would also include things like um, making the access faster. So if we apply for a project and we get it five, five years later, this doesn't help. This would also include things like uh, maybe introduce the climate fee or something to the travel industry to generate the funds. And this has been done with Unitaid um, earlier, uh, where they raised um, a money, f uh, money, this is housed in WHO, to, uh, to, to address a health crisis. And so we know this is work. There is a study that says even if you put a $1 to an economy ticket in one year, you could get four, t uh, you could get $4 billion. And this is not counting the business class and the other classes that could be t uh, that, that could have a higher fee. And this could also include uh, tapping into sovereign wealth funds. This could also be countries politically calling at a higher level to have an administrative account in the IMF to address a climate emergency that could make all the difference in addressing the climate impacts that we're talking about. So I think here we are in a critical moment in, in the world to really deeply think about the financial systems and the architecture that exists. What we can also be working on the reforms of ex existing funding mechanisms, and we could also be working on establishing uh, funds for loss and damage, for example. Um, this, this is so critical for small island states. So none of these are mutually exclusive. I think we could be doing wor working on all of this at the same time. So I think the multiple, these multiple solutions, these mosaic of solutions um, has to be um, addressed. And I think that's something that small islands, when talking about the blue economy, which at the end of the day isn't a niche economy, it's the anchor of life and livelihoods and culture of small islands everywhere, has taught us that there is no one size fits all. Whether it's finance, it's about price, it's about timeliness, there is no time to wait. It's about making sure that we can align the grant financing to the loan financing, to attract private capital. Where is the private sector? How can we make a coral reef economy attractive to private investment too? I really want to th thank you, Chamberlain and Khadija. This has been a fantastic conversation all around the importance of the blue economy, both its vulnerability, but also the opportunities and what it can bring and what it does for small islands and how adaptation and reducing vulnerability and building resilience is so critical to what is the beating heart of small islands, its ocean economy. And before we go, I just want to show a few videos to just provide us some pictures of what you both have been doing and what a blue economies actually look like and what they're doing in the climate space. Did you know that if you could put all of the Earth's land masses together, the Pacific Ocean would still be bigger? The combined exclusive economic zones of the 12 World Bank Pacific member countries is more than 17 million square kilometers. That's larger than the United States. And countries like Kiribati, Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and Papua New Guinea are among the 20 largest exclusive economic zones on the planet. 
Yet now, more than ever before, the ocean's health is at great risk due to pollution, overfishing, and climate change. Through the Pacific Islands Regional Oceanscape Program, or PROP, the World Bank is working closely with governments, regional organizations, and communities in the Pacific to help countries improve their sustainable management of ocean fisheries, coastal fisheries, and to strengthen institutions responsible for conservation. PROP aims to improve ocean management across the Pacific through more sustainable fishing practices, better surveillance of Pacific EE sets, and enforcement of fishing regulations, and improved access to regional markets, delivering better returns from every catch. We are proud to be part of the movement of ocean protectors in the Pacific. I think these images were the perfect complement to Chamberlain and Khadija's words today, which is all about the fact that the oceans for small islands are the beating heart of your economy, but with rising sea levels and with rising temperatures in the oceans, which are adding to hurricane strength and cyclone strength, they're also a source of risk. And that's why this idea of island systems management is so important it's about better governance across sectors, with neighbors, with development partners. It's about having the data you need downscale to where it can help drive decision making. And it's about finance, how much and how easily it can be accessed in a timely matter so that it makes a difference. Huge thank you, Khadija. Thank you so much, Chamberlain, and good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.